But this one in particular looks at his hypermodern approach. Hypermodern approach, we've got to really define. So when I say hypermodern, a lot of people, especially ranked beginners, and even sometimes more advanced players, don't really understand the definition of what hypermodern is. So I'll say hypermodern, I'm talking about controlling the center with pieces rather than occupying it with pawns. So when I play one knight f3, I'm controlling e5, I'm controlling d4, central squares, without directly controlling them with pawns. Knight f3 is referred to as ready's opening, or the red key. Usually the move transposes to other openings along the line. But when I play one knight f3, that's technically the red key opening. This is the way Nimzovich opens the game against Rubinstein in Semmering 1926. Both players I have great respect for. Rubinstein plays the most classical fashion here with one d5. So we have hypermodern against classical. Hypermodern influencing the center with the pieces. Classical staking out the center with a pawn or maybe two pawns ideally. The classical center would be both pawns in the center at d5 and e5 if allowed. Hypermodern can be taken to different extremes. I can completely give you the center by playing moves like g3 and bishop g2, giving you two pawns in the center. So the various extremes. I would call knight f3 in the way Nimzovich approaches this as sort of moderate hypermodernism. Now, b3. B3 is a move that's definitely in the spirit of hypermodern openings. It's not extremely hypermodern, but it definitely has to be classified as hypermodern. We're going to play in Queen's Indian style. Some people call this the Queen's Indian attack. Some people call it the Nimzovich attack. Uh, some people go as far as to say B3 is the Nimzovich's, is the Nimzovich's opening. Some people call it Larson's opening. We'll also look at Larson games in the series. But regardless of the name, the idea is simple. Co coordinated control of e5, the dark squares, d4. And just keep in mind, because you start out playing hypermodern, you're controlling the center with pieces. doesn't mean you're never going to stake out the center with pawns. This doesn't mean you're never going to use your pawns in the center. It's sort of a delayed approach to controlling the center with pawns, waiting with the pawns, staying flexible. So b3 now. Black plays in a very classical fashion. I'm not sure this is objectively best. I think one of the most dangerous moves here, and I'm going to give away some trade secrets by saying this, but I think bishop g4, as I've seen some strong players play this move. Vladimir Bermakin played this against me, Grandmaster Bermakin. I think bishop g4 is a really good approach. You're threatening to double the pawns. You're controlling e5. And unlike against a move like c4, where sometimes the queen can come out and sort of unpin itself by the d1a4 diagonal, when you play b3, or b4 for that matter, bishop g4 is particularly good because the white queen can't escape and come out to say b3. On b3, the white queen could attack b7. Once you play b3, that can't happen. So I think that bishop g4 is maybe the best move. Rubinstein played a little too classically with c5 here. It's a good move. c5, there's nothing wrong with it, but I think you're not really taking advantage of white's position, of the drawbacks of b3. Now white played bishop b2, and black played knight to c6, and white plays e3. And you have to keep in mind, white would like to strike at the center at some point. But for example, if we go back and if we try to play c4 too early, all we're doing is giving black a good, good Benoni with d4, a good Benoni formation, where b3 has contributed little to white's fighting for the center. So we don't want to play c4 too early when black can play d4. Now e3 played by Nimzovich, and e3 preparing development of the kingside bishop, primarily bishop b5. Now, some people here believe that a6 is the best move, and I think there's a definite argument for a6. 
wasn't played in the game. It's a very modern idea used by Petrosian and Kasparov. Reverse positions in the Queen's Indian to stop Bishop B5. A6 is a good idea. There are drawbacks to A6. It's a little bit of a waste of time. Maybe it encourages moves like C4. Maybe C4 becomes a little bit more valid now because black has wasted time with A6. So D4 also would be a loss. Black would be playing at a loss of time. Um, but I think A6 is a good good approach. Nimzovich played his normal hypermodern stuff. Rubenstein sort of approaching very classically, maybe too classically. Knight F6. Now, one thing black isn't worried about is bishop takes f6. I don't think that's really dangerous here. White has gone to too much trouble, really too much trouble, to control that long diagonal to just give that piece up in this particular position. So that's not an issue. Bishop b5. Now, look how everything focuses. Knight attacking e5, bishop on b2, pressuring e5. Now, the bishop on b5 pinning the knight to the king on e8. The focus is on e5. It's a coordinated, focused approach. White is going to be willing to give up that bishop for the knight. This is basically a Nimzo Indian with colors reversed. Black doesn't want to see doubled pawns. He could allow it. But Nimzovich won so many games by inflicting doubled C pawns on his opponents. Rubenstein didn't want to see that, so he plays bishop to d7. Yeah, the move is a little passive, but it concretely solves the problem of the doubled pawns. Therefore, I think a very valid defense. A little quiet, but very solid. Now white castles. Now there's one thing I want to mention that could happen in this kind of position. You never know when it's going to happen. But black could always move his knight, even possibly back to b8, to a trade bishop for bishop rather than allow bishop for knight. So he would have better control over e5. But I think it's too extreme such an early stage to consider retreating the knight back to b8. At this point, black's move, e6. The other possibility there was g6. Let's take a little look at that. If black had played g6, would we really have to consider bishop takes f6? Well, I think now it's, it's a little bit more of a valid. I mean, the ob obvious damage to the pawn structure would be more serious. So I would have to recapture away from the center with E takes F6. There would be pawns, two pawn islands that were torn apart. White could try to continue positionally playing like D4 and C3. Just keep a very solid formation. And the pawn at D5 could be weak. Sometimes you see this in the so-called English defense where black goes d4, e6, c4, b6. Same structure. Yes, this is a valid play for white. I mean, a valid plan to try to really play against the weakness in the pawn structure. So Rubenstein doesn't allow that. He plays e6, passive, but keeping the knight protected by the queen, so there's no double pawns. Now white has to choose a plan. If you play d4 in this position, you're creating a weird situation. After d4, pawn takes pawn. For example, d4, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn. There's certain drawbacks to white's position. The bishop at b2 is obstructed by the pawn at d4. And in this coley zuckertort kind of formation, the bishop doesn't belong on b5. It belongs on d3. We can help out by attacking the king side, attacking h7. So with the bishop on b5, the d4 formation doesn't really make a lot of sense. Nimzovich goes for his classic setup, d3. And we, so the idea is to get the bishop outside the pawn chain and then start putting the pawns on the correct white square complex. So the remaining bishop is a good bishop with the pawns on white squares. Here, objectively, black could consider playing bishop d6 the most active move. Probably the best. He played more quietly with bishop e7. White continues to build up in the center and develop with knight on b to d2. Naturally, he doesn't want to obstruct his bishop at b2 and starts to look forward to possibly playing e4, grabbing space in the center. This is what I said about the hypermodern approach. Just because you don't start out taking the center immediately with pawns, 
doesn't mean you're not later on planning to occupy the center with pawns. Just in good time. Now, Black Castle. Now, here's an interesting, a very interesting point, in my opinion. If White continues here, how is he going to continue to build up? Perhaps a move is plausible like Rook E1. But what starts to concern me after a while, once there's no pin on this diagonal, B5 to E8, the white bishop on B5 is sort of hanging out to dry, so to speak. Now I would think white starts wasting time with slow, very slow build-up moves, say rook E1. Black should really start to consider playing knight to B8. Trade bishop for bishop. It's a bad bishop on D7. It's like in the French defense, very limited. And I think trading bishop for bishop would be good here. After bishop takes bishop, knight takes bishop, we got rid of our worst piece. So Nimzovich, although a lot of people might not understand this move, gets rid of the bishop for the knight unprovoked right away with bishop takes c6 because he doesn't want to sit around and see black play a move like knight b8, forcing trade of bishop for bishop. Instead of the dynamic and double-edged bishop takes knight, as we see here, focusing on the e5 square, black plays bishop takes c6, and now knight e5, threatening to double the pawns, big positional threat, and occupying this point on e5. And part and parcel with Nimzovich's plan is to support the center with f4. And this you also see colors reversed in the Nimzo Indian. I believe that black should play either rook c8 or queen, something like queen c7 here. Plan on recapturing the bishop, give the bishop back, and support it with a piece, and continue development. Maybe rook c8 is by, I would say, the best move. Nimzovich also has to play the opponent, and he knows Rubenstein is in love with the two bishops. Rubenstein really loves to use the two bishops. He goes out of his way in this game to preserve those bishops. I don't know if this is a good move or not. It's a very, very double-edged idea, strategically speaking, because it loses a lot of time. Putting a bishop in a place where it's really, it's not clear it's going to be a good piece ever in this closed position where all the pawns are on the board. So I think Nezvich was happy to see this move. Now f4, position kind of turns into a dutch, but it's very closed. And the key word in a closed position is that knights can be better than bishops. Bishops need open lines. So the bishop pair is definitely not as strong as you would normally think in, a, in an average chess game here, with all those pawns on the board blocking the bishops. But Rubenstein continues to play the best defense, knight d7. When you have a, a piece, a knight, entrenched on a strong square like e5, you cannot allow it to live there. You cannot allow it to stay, not for a long time. So this is absolutely the best move. Get rid of the piece right away. And not only is he threatening to trade it off, but he's threatening f6 as well, getting rid of it permanently. And f6 will also give some squares to the limited bishop on e8. Now, in retrospect, it looks like white's best move was probably queen g4. Queen g4 with threats against g7. And notice you can't play f6 here because e6 is too weak. I think queen g4, knight takes knight, was what Nimzovich didn't really like. Knight takes knight, and if bishop takes, black can just play to trade things off with bishop f6. But white, white stands a little bit better here. Or maybe pawn takes is better, keeping the pieces on the board. White has some space because of the wedge at e5, and he can start thinking about rook lifts, like rook f3, doubling rooks, maybe moving a rook over to g3 or h3. The pawn on e5, although the bishop is bad on b2, definitely gives white some attacking chances. So that would have been an interesting alternative to what happened in the game. Nimzovich instead simply trades on d7. Knight takes d7. Now another interesting moment. Maybe black could consider taking with a bishop here. It's kind of a tough call. 
I think he wanted to transfer the bishop to the king side, maybe on f7, but anyway, he sliced it. That bishop's not going to be really great. And perhaps it was simpler just to take back with the bishop and try to put the bishop on c6. Instead, he plays queen takes d7, which is also viable. And then white continues to take space in the center now with e4. e4 putting some pressure on d5. And really, I think white is hoping black will exchange on e4 and give him a good square for his knight, an outpost, on e4. Of course, Rubenstein wants to keep the, st the structure flexible, and that's normally what you do with the two bishops. Try to keep the tension, keep everything fluid. He plays f6, nullifying the pressure from the bishop on the long diagonal, keeping the pawns relatively fluid as much as possible, giving the bishop some squares from e8. White now puts more pressure on the center and continues to develop with queen f3. Prepares to bring his king, rather queen's rook, into the game, possibly to e1, where it will play along the e-file. It's also queen f3, also puts pressure on the center, puts pressure on d5. I think black, sh black can, should possibly consider closing the game at some point with d4. But that's what's such a double-edged trick here. Nimzovich and Rubenstein both know that bishops need open lines. So closing the game is normally considered to be a mistake. But if white's bishop on b2 becomes too strong, then black should definitely consider playing d4. Another possibility here that I like for black would have been perhaps b5. Look at this move, b5. But he was worried if b5 too early, the rook isn't protected at a8. So white might be able to strike with something like a4, he also has to watch for moves like f5, undermining the pawn structure at d5 and e6. So Rubenstein takes his time and plays bishop f7. Obviously, these are not great bishops. Look at the bishops on f7 and e7. Very restricted by all their own pawns. This is an ideal situation where the knight might be superior to the bishop. Now, white started to realize that b5 and c4 is the classic plan to break up the pawns on the queen side and really damage white's pawn structure. So Nimzovich goes and plays a prophylactic move, a4, trying to hold up black's advances on the queen side with b5. a4 is a well-timed prophylactic semi-defensive move. See, now if a6, preparing b5, white will play a5 and fix the pawns forever. That would be a huge positional mistake for Rubenstein. So he plays b6 first, Classic build-up plan with b6, a6, and then eventually b5. Now white goes to the center, completes his development, rook on a to e1, threatening possible breakthroughs along the e-file. This is obviously a good square for the rook where it has potential. And then black simply continues classic plan on the queen side, a6. And it looks like black has everything in order. White has no immediate threats that he can see. Suddenly there is a problem, f5. So black has a number of choices after f5. And I think this is probably the most critical moment in this game. Honestly, it's really hard to criticize Rubenstein's play. Everything he done, he's done has been fairly principled. And, you know, it was a judgment call on keeping the bishop, bringing it back to e8. He cost him, it really cost him a lot of time, but it's difficult to say that Rubenstein made any clear mistakes. And now this is a really key moment. With the bishops, you normally want to keep the pawn tension. And I think that's more or less what you want to try to do, keep some tension in the position. Here, this is a tough moment, though. Maybe closing the position, shutting down the bishop at b2 would have been the right try. Even d4, shutting down the bishop on b2. The way he plays it, he leaves that bishop with some real scope. So, pawn takes e4. Now this, maybe this is what he missed. He probably expected knight takes e4. But queen takes e4, a simple move from Nimzovich, obviously not his original intention, this forces black to fix the position now because of the pressure along the e-file. Now black has to play e5. Still, I think black's position is reasonable. 
but the situation has been closed. The pawns are locked, and with locked pawns, the knight is quite a strong piece. So after e5, the position is forced to be locked in the center. Black still has chances to play for b5, and that's exactly what he's going to do. But now White has space, thanks to playing up to f5. He has a lot of space along the third rank, along the fourth rank, to operate his pieces for a kingside attack. And that's what happens here. Rook e3. Immediately, White using his space advantage to launch a kingside attack. This is the real point of White's play. And the bishop on b2 still has some scope. It's attacking e5. It may look dead, but it's a lot more alive than if Black had played a pawn to d4. White continues to have to worry about the queen side after Black plays b5, and a breakthrough is threatened at c4. However, White has a real kingside attack starting thanks to his space. He plays rook g3. Now we're looking at serious threats against g7. This is something Black cannot ignore for a long time. He plays a defensive move, king h8. But the king may or may not be all that safe there. The pawn at f5 really restricting Black defensively, not giving him much space to maneuver. The king could still be in danger on the h file although he does have the move bishop g8 dropping back defensively. Now, the white has to come up with something here. Increasing the pressure, knight f3. Knight f3 with the idea of knight h4 and knight g6. This is a really strong attacking plan. And Nimzovich, of course, excelled in closed positions. Here, black has to start thinking defensively. Instead, he thought he could take liberties. He captures at a4. Pawn takes a4, expecting white to have to recapture. Black probably only looking at knight h4, threats of knight g6. He thought it was too slow. And suddenly, Nimzovich has a crushing shot. Knight takes e5, a tactic out of the blue, bringing the whole long diagonal to life. Honestly, Rubenstein is lucky he wasn't lost immediately after this move. Looking only for knight h4, expecting a recapture on a4, suddenly the white position just comes to life with deadly threats on the long diagonal. Brilliant shot from Nimzovich. Black is fortunate he doesn't lose material by force. He gets to play queen e8, by the way, guarding against threats of g6. Let's just take a peek at what would have happened if he accepted this piece. F takes e5, and now queen takes e5. Triple threatening g7 with a rook, bishop and queen all in the long diagonal, and if bishop f6, queen takes f6. Exclamation point, mating attack, g takes f6, bishop takes f6, mate. And that would have been a truly crushing way to end the game. Rubenstein, of course, you know, he's not going to fall for a simple mate. He missed a shot, knight takes e5. He rebounds to defend with queen e8. The game goes on. But white has cracked the black structure. He's destroyed the strong point at e5. The white bishop at b2 now is more powerful than ever with the black e5 pawn gone. So the slow buildup by white in the center slow to, to put the pawns in the center, the hypermodern approach has given white chances nevertheless. He's in fact even gone to and destroyed the black center after all this. Undermined or destroyed the black center. Now white is in fact the one with more pawns, a D pawn. More pawns than black in the center. Unbelievable. After queen e8, queen g4, concretely threatening mate at g7. Black cannot afford to play g6 and loosen the diagonal from a1 to h8. He cannot afford to move anything on that diagonal. Instead, he plays rook g8. And this is a really key moment. This game has been analyzed, really analyzed a lot over the years. And it turns out the best move would have been the tempting knight to g6 check. This would have been extremely strong. After knight to g6 check, Bishop takes knight. Obviously, pawn takes is just too dangerous. Bishop takes knight. 
pawn takes, and now the question is, you can't take with a queen, because of queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, rook h3 mate. So h6 would have been the only try. And now black is so close to getting mated by some kind of sacrifice on h6, probably wouldn't have been, would not have been defensible. Rook h3, for example, we're just building up and threatening something like bishop c1, or even maybe queen f4, would have been too hard for black to defend against the threats. That's what analysis has said in retrospect. During the game, Rubinstein didn't find it. Instead, he played a simpler approach. It's also good. It's also good. He remains a pawn up, but it's a matter of technique now. Knight takes b7, rather f7 check. Queen takes f7, and queen takes a4. We can say that white is winning here. Positionally, he's got the better pawn structure. He's a pawn up, but he did miss what was analyzed very deeply to be a win with knight g6 check. So one tactic wins a pawn. Another tactic probably would have led to a winning attack. Nimzovic goes with a simple approach, which flaws the game slightly, but still a very instructive hypermodern game. So after queen takes a4, once again, I, I want to reiterate, White not only is up pawn up, but he also has a better structure. So he's got more than one advantage here. Black tries to centralize with queen to d5. Now white, again, ties black down with queen to g4, keeping that rook tied down to g7. Good move. Don't allow the opponent to free himself. How can black free himself? He can never play the break c4 or a4 very easily. One can argue that white has a much better bishop here. Black plays bishop to d8. Hard to understand that move, really. Perhaps in some lines to play rook a7, defend along the seventh rank. Now, white starts to get really creative. Look at this move. Queen g6. That's what space can do for you. Queen g6 threatening queen takes h7, queen sacrifice followed by rook h3 mate. And you can't take it because of rook h3 check immediately in mate. Amazing resource. Black has to do something. He can't move his rook, by the way. So he has to play h6. And this seriously weakens black's king side. Again, now the threats against h6 become very, very serious. White gets his last piece in the game with rook e1. This threatens rook e8, which would be extremely dangerous. That would tie the black rook down on g8, prevent it from defending g7 properly. So black defends with queen d7, protecting against rook e8. Now rook e6. Beginning to threaten things against sacrifices against f6. Multiple sacrifices against f6 become a real problem here for black. Black just ignores it, plays c4. Perhaps there was some time pressure here. Of course, hoping that white takes with the pawn on d3, takes c4, allowing the black queen to come down to d1. There is a winning combination now. Again, it looks like rook takes f6 would have been a win. Nimzovic again plays it safe. And I can't blame him for this. b takes c4. Perhaps in time pressure, you've got to be on the safe side. So b takes c4. Hard to blame white for playing that move. Now black gets some counterplay. Rook b8. Bishop to c3. Now black is able to flush the white king out a little bit. But still, the black king is in the corner. White has a lot of pawns to protect his king. After rook b1 check, even if the white king at some point gets flushed out, he's going to have plenty of pawn protection. The pawns at c2, d3, and c4 will give white's king protection. Even if he has to run out at some point. For the time being, he's safe. He plays rook e1. And now bishop to b6, check. No real problem there. Just sort of ghost threats. King f1, rook takes e1, check. Bishop takes e1. 
It looks like black has just some vague ghost threats here. He can throw, throw in queen d4, but even if you get in queen d4, queen g1 check, the white king can run out to e2. Remember, the white queen at g6 is protecting against possible rook e8s in some lines. Black instead played queen to a4, threatening the pawn chain. This looks a little slow, because queen takes c2 won't even be with check yet. Now white plays rook to h3, of course, devastating mating threat with rook takes h6 at hand. Black has to do something. Now, where to put the rook? Obviously, rook e8 looks like a tempting move to go to the open file. There are some technical problems, very technical problems here. If rook e8 looks active, that is 30, 35 rook e8, rook takes h6 check, pawn takes rook, queen takes h6 check, king g1, queen g6 check. King h1, queen takes f6 check, king g1. Believe it or not, black is getting mated after losing all his king side by bishop to c3, and there's no defense. Amazing line. He can also lose his queen after queen d7. Queen d7, queen h8 check, king f7, queen g7. That's just mate as well. So it's unbelievable, but this whole line irrefutable. Rook e8, the active looking move, doesn't work. Instead, black has to play a passive rook move. Going back to the position after 35, rook h3, black has to play the passive rook f8, which keeps f6 protected for the time being. Now bishop c3, mounting pressure against f6 again. Now it looks like black's got some counterplay. But once again, it's just too dangerous. If queen takes c2, rook takes h6 check. Extremely strong threats. Let's take a look at that line. If queen takes c2, rook takes h6 check. Pawn takes h6. Queen takes h6. King g8. Again, similar to the last line, queen g6 check. King h8, now we're going to play bishop takes, f6 check, forcing rook takes, queen takes f6 check. We're going to take the bishop on b6, and there's no perpetual here. White is up a whole bunch of pawns. So again, another line where white sacrifices everything and wins everything back. There was no time for black to play queen takes c2. Amazing tactical game. The way this positional game turned into a tactic fest, just amazing. So instead of queen takes c2, black has to defend with bishop d8. But being in such a passive situation without counterplay is not a good sign. So now white plays another move. Having to find these kind of moves is what really makes the difference between a great grandmaster and an average master to keep, keep finding the best move every time. White shifts again with bishop to d2 threatening bishop takes h6. This is the final killer threat. Now black plays queen takes c2, bishop takes h6. There's no way you can stop the breakthrough now. Queen to b1 check. Now the king comes out. There's no real danger here. King to e2. Queen to b2 check. Now if we come back with the bishop, we have to deal with things like queen e5. White plays a different move here. King to e3. It's hard to believe this is really a good move, but it is. King e3. And now what can black do? He just runs out of checks. It's amazing. Just completely running out of checks. Notice, if we go back, if we play like king f3, Black can play queen to b7 check, and the annoying checks continue. So king e3. Now if queen e5 check, king f3, and there's no more checks. Or, as in the game, king e3, 
bishop to b6, check. Unbelievable move. Now, this also would have been played against queen c1, check. King e4. It's just funny how there's very little that black can actually do on the white squares because the white queen is protecting e8. Black is unable to mount any serious threats on the white squares. Queen, e2 check, and then the most ironic move of all, rook e3. Keeping the mate threat at g7, rook threatening the queen at e2, the queen on g6 defending g2. Nothing black can do. He has to lose decisive material or get mated. And Rubenstein resigned. Matched move for move in that game. Rubenstein with a classic hypermodern opening. I hope everyone enjoyed that, and we're going to continue in the series, hypermodern chess. We're going to see other games from masters like, for example, Larson, Reti. So stay tuned into our lecture series, our chess video presentations here.